Um, thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. As Owen mentioned, my name is Mark Baker, I'm director of Carbon Tanzania. Carbon Tanzania is a conservation business. We work with communities, with villages, with the wildlife management areas, system to value landscapes. And when I say value, I mean create economic value by linking with businesses and organizations around the world and bringing that revenue into businesses in Tanzania. RED, if you've not heard of it before, stands for Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Degradation. It's one of the fundamental methodologies that's been accepted under the Paris Climate Agreement. It also is a methodology that works in the voluntary carbon market, the space in which we, Carbon Tanzania, operate. Now, I've got a feeling that I'm probably the odd person in the room here because I'm not an agriculturalist, I'm certainly not a farmer, I just like eating your produce. So, first of all, thank you and well done. So, just briefly to go over our approach, we work with partners to secure communal rights. That means, under Tanzanian law, we work under the Forest Act to decentralise forest resource ownership, the Village Land Act to put in place CCROs, Community Customary Right of Occupancy, or Hatimaliki in Swahili. And that's the basis for how we're able to secure this land within the context of a land use plan. And for those of you not familiar with how that works in Tanzania, generally you have an area set aside for agriculture, an area set aside for protection, and an area set aside for pastoralism. We then work to strengthen governance within these areas, and of course, increasing benefits is the basis of what we do. We have three projects. All of these areas uh, total about 600,000 hectares, or, and they are all in wildlife dispersal areas or corridors within the country. The basis of protecting wildlife is a key part of what we attempt to achieve. Um, and, it, and we work with pastoralists, Bantu Agro pastoralists, and with Hadza hunter-gatherers. And I'm going to look at that in a bit more detail. Now, when I look at that landscape, what I see is 116 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare, 57 different species of acacia camifera tree. I see an environment that's robust in the context of climate change. I see an environment that supports 400 species of bird, multiple species of large mammal, and of course, human populations which are part of this landscape and have been so for a very long period of time. In, in the Ida Valley, we work with the Hadza hunter-gatherers. These are people who can trace back their history 40,000 years. Um, they generally feed on honey, wildlife, tubers, and a variety of root systems, as well as ugali, tomatoes, Mars bars, and all the other things as well. As I said, the context of wildlife, these are Basira Oryx and Makame Wildlife Management Area that's just southeast of um, uh, Tarangiri National Park. The largest community conservation area in Tanzania at 4,000 square kilometers. And this is what the habitat looks like, Miombo Dryland Forest between Mahali and Katavi National Parks in western Tanzania, again one of our project areas. And fundamentally what we aim is to keep those trees in the ground. We don't plant trees. Trees plant trees, they're really good at it. Been doing it for about 500 million years. So we keep trees in the ground. So what's the context? Well in Tanzania, as many of, I'm sure many of you know, as agriculturalists, we're losing about 400 to 500,000 hectares per year to predominantly shifting agriculture. Um, that equates to 100 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per year going into the environment. Annual deforestation rate is about 3 to 9 percent, percent depending on where you are, so higher than population growth. It's a figure worth keeping in your mind. 
And most deforestation is having it on unprotected village lands. That's village lands that do not have any form of land use planning. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, that by 2030 there'll be 83 million people trying to obtain a living from these landscapes. So really, the language that we're going to start using here is economically productive landscapes for people as an alternative to shifting agriculture, not instead of any form of planned agriculture. Those two are very distinctly different. So let's just take a look at some of the data here. Um, first of all, let's just take a moment and just step back and think, OK, the basis of what we're doing here is in the context of climate change. And what does that mean? Because you see a lot of confused information in relation to climate change. Firstly, climate, 30 years. That's the context of how we think when we contract with villagers to um, but support their land use planning to create jobs, to keep forests in the ground. We contract for 30 years. Because 30 years is the period in which you can use the word climate. Anything less than that and you're using the word weather. They are distinctly different things. Climate change is changing the planet. We are now in the Anthro Anthropocene, a period in human history driven by our species, humans. We are no longer in the Holocene, that period of great calm in which we evolved. So when we talk about climate change, we're talking about rapid change within the Earth's hydrology. We're talking about rapid change within the context of how climate functions within the biosphere and the hydrosphere. So let's just jump back to this map we're looking at. These are Landsat images. I'm sure many of you know the Landsat satellite it flies above us every 16 days and takes a picture. And we can go back in time with those images and look at change. And specifically what we're interested in is the conversion of woodland, grassland, swampland systems over time to cultivated land. So we're just going to run through this very quickly. The two of our projects are there on the map. For those of you familiar with Tanzania, the blue lake you see close to the bottom of that, that's Bahi Swamp. Bahi Swamp is just to the west of Dodoma. So you're looking at a large landscape. 2005, 2010, 2015. And let me just run through that again. You see this rapid shift in the amount of land being degraded. Now, to say that land is being driven by shifting agriculture doesn't mean that the land is now under agriculture. That's not what's happening. What's happening is the land is utilized for agriculture, and as many of you know, degrades relatively quickly, loses soil quality, people move on. So let's just have a look at a land use plan. And again, for those of you who are working and living in Tanzania, this will be something that's quite familiar to you. This is a land use plan for three villages in the Yaida Valley. And within the land use plan, and if this is developed by communities, what you have is different areas, but for different uses. And by having a land use plan, the agricultural area is in the best soil for agriculture, the best slope for agriculture, is close to the road for mobility, you have grazing areas because in this particular place, in Yaida Valley, for those of you who know it, you have a combination of agriculturalists and pastoralists who want to have seasonal grazing. And there with the red line around it, that's a CCRO. It's the first one in Tanzania, land given title to a whole community. And in this case, the Hadza. And that's sort of what a land use plan looks like on the ground. That's the Yassi Rift you see in the back of the picture there. On top of that, if you were to go further up, is agriculture again. But it's about breaking up the landscape, having agriculture within a plan, and having a plan about what you're doing with your pastoralist to reduce conflict between those two land use types. And so how do we measure, how do we know what we're achieving is real, is permanent, and verifiable? 
two important aspects in red projects and two in and some in very important aspects of developing our product. What we sell, our product, is this, better planned land and reduced deforestation. So if we look through these maps, we've got the Yida Valley there in our project area in the year 2000. Between 2005, 2000, 2005, we see, see farms start to open up in what is an area that was designated by law for the Hadza. 2005 to 2010, those areas start to get bigger. We start to see an increase of shifting agriculture. 2010, our project intervenes. And between 2010 and 2015, we see the agriculture increase within the agricultural area, planned agriculture, and the areas outside of that decrease. And that's what we see based on that satellite imagery. The reference region, the region we're looking at with Landsat images, those historical images, change over time. We have a village land use plan with no enforcement. We call it a leakage area, but that's uh, just the terminology we use, where we can see a percentage change. But the key here is that the percentage change within the Hadza's land, where we measure our carbon, where we verify that carbon, is reduced to 0.1% a year. So let's talk money, because that's the real value system here. When we sell our carbon offset is the word that's commonly used, verified emission reduction is the technical word, what are we selling? What does this product actually look like? We're essentially selling a biochemical reaction, which is, if you think about it, a little bit strange. What we're doing is we're packaging the benefits to communities, we're packaging the benefits to wildlife, we're packaging, packaging the climate impact into a verified emission reduction. And what that does is that that is then sold to companies that have developed emission reduction strategies. And those companies, we work with 21 different companies around the world, and those companies are very diverse. Some of them are pet food companies, some of them are tourism companies. Um, and there is a wide variety of reasons that drive people to buy this product. Corporate social responsibility, um, to develop their own brand, to create unique brands. And it avoids the process, what the verification, when I use this word verification, that's what avoids the greenwashing. That this is a third party verified process. When we transfer revenue to the communities, and you can see from when we started there, 2013, we made our first transfers to Yida, and we have slowly been able to meet our demands by selling, by increasing our marketing. It's a very important part of the product. Until now, we can create agreements with companies that guarantee payments going forward into the future, which means we can guarantee payments going forward. And I'm just going to show you very briefly what those payments look like um, on the ground. So generally revenue, the decision is made at the village and community level. The decision is not made by us. And this is the decision that those communities make. They pay their community scouts. These are people whose job it is to enforce land use plans, to collect data. Village government gets a share of money. District government gets a share of money. Ward government gets a share of money. There is a health insurance scheme that's been put together. All school fees up to university level are paid for out of this carbon revenue. And there's a variety of work and training that the communities choose to pay. In the context of the Hadza, the vast majority of money is used to buy food. And what the Hadza do will buy millet and will buy maize early in the year and store it. Or they can put money down to guarantee a certain price. So it helps them to reduce their costs in terms of buying agricultural produce. Now we've got plenty of time for questions and I figure there will be quite a few, so I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, so in simple terms, you are 
connecting villages that are willing to protect land to get paid for this by companies all over the world who are willing to pay for this. Very simple. Yes, it is that simple. The mechanics of it are slightly more complicated because of course we need to be able to measure what we're doing exactly and be able to verify that through third party verification which is important. It gives you your mihuri, it gives you your legal stamp to be able to sell that into a market and you have to fulfill certain requirements to do that. But yes, in a sense, that's correct. Um, so are you looking for more communities that are willing to do this? Um, we can't expand quick enough. Our limit now is not on the availability of investment to do this, but on the types of areas and projects that would suit the context for this type of um, development. It can be very area um, specific, uh, so it really does depend on the context of the forest, where it is, who the people are working there, how big forests are, what connectivity they, they sort of provide. So we're currently in three areas of Tanzania and looking at our next project development, which will probably be the Saluniasa Wildlife Corridor. But yes, we can certainly um, look anywhere in the country. There's no shortage, of defor no shortage of deforestation and there's certainly no shortage of people in rural environments that want to earn money. Okay, so you're, you're concentrating on, on, on areas where there is still forest and try to keep it, keep it so. Okay. Yeah, correct. Um, the regeneration in many parts of um, this part of the world, sub-Saharan Africa, probably as far down as um, Namibia, is extremely difficult working in the context of community land. Um, you know, people love to talk about planting trees, and I think it's great in an agroforestry type setting and in an urban setting. But the reality is that lots of places planting the right kind of trees, getting the ecological context right, dealing with the natural um, impacts such as disease, fire, baboons love tree seedlings. You know, the, in terms of cost value, much better cost an economic value to work with communities where forests already exist than try to recover or regenerate. Okay, sorry, last question. How much do villages get per year or how much does a village get for a certain area? So in the context of Yaida, uh, three villages, um, population, depending whose census and data you you listen to, um, there's about a thousand Hadza that move in and out of the CCRO area. Um, there's about 2,000 people living within the villages in that sort of context. So let's call it four. Um, the 2012 census data is, is a bit off and certainly because people are, are moving around the landscape, it's a little bit sort of complicated. Um, so they're getting about 100 million shillings every six months in cash. And that we, what we, we hold the burden of the administrative cost to that. So we pay Hydem Hospital, we pay um, the education account, we pay the, um, we pay the community account, we pay using M-Pesa, pay the village game scouts on behalf of the village. Um, so that's about how much money goes in. Um, in the context of Makame, WMA, you know, we're, we're going to get up to a, yes, it's, it's a significant amount of money. It's certainly significant enough to meet the opportunity costs that are, that are associated with, and I think this is important because I think people often miss this. When you put land use planning into a village or you work with a community in some way, there's all, you're always asking people to take a risk. They're taking a risk in you, essentially. So, yes, the, the money is certainly enough to meet those sorts of opportunity costs. I'd, I'd be interested to reflect because, you know, I know a few years ago uh, I, I tried to do a bit of a, uh, a review of what sorts of carbon trading schemes were going on in Africa and I think the only one, real one that was moving was this one of Environ Trade in, around Gorongosa in Mozambique, I think you probably know of it, which actually I think went belly up at one point because the price of carbon collapsed so far that it was no longer viable. And, I mean, 
so, I mean, could you tell me something about the sort of the price of carbon that has to be in order to make these sorts of things work? And I think the, the well, and, and another, I've got a couple more questions. Maybe we just start with that one. I'll, I'll follow up. Could you just start with that one and then? Yeah, no problem. So EnviroTrade was the Plan Vivo project around Gorongosa that was a very early um, starter in the market. I think about 2005, 2006, that Plan Vivo project. Um, there has been a number of um, projects like red projects, a little bit like ours, that were started by the Norwegian Climate Initiative in 2008 onwards, and they virtually all failed to get verification. Now, one of the reasons is because this mechanism is a business mechanism, and it's very, very hard for NGOs working in the forestry sector specifically to engage in a program and a process that looks 30 years into the future. Really, they're working with and restricted by money that wants to overlay a project within four or five years. And I'm sure anybody here working for an NGO, if they go and try and get donor money from a big organization and say, hey, we've got a great plan, by the way, it's 30 years, they'll just laugh. So th there's a key aspect towards creating the business model here and running it like a business model to make it successful, to make it cost effective, to make it long term. Now going back to your price on carbon, that's where it dovetails into this business model. Early estimates were estimates. We now have a very, very strong figure. So we look at about six, um, about six to seven dollars a ton. But you know, we also work in a market where there's shaded pricing. So we work with people who are buying for ten tons, and we work with people who are buying for five, sorry, ten dollars a ton, and we work with people who are buying for five dollar a ton. So what we do in our contracts with communities is we guarantee 60% to the community. That's guaranteed, and we guarantee three dollars. So obviously we don't sell for lower than five. But that's about the market rate at the moment. And it's a market, so there is fluctuation um, and less so competition. And I think early on, the concepts of what a carbon market was and really how you value this produce and verify it was still a little bit out in the open. And that's really been refined and thought through now. So a couple more. And I mean, I, I appreciate what you're doing very much, but, but it just sort of raises these sort of questions in my head. So I worked in Zimbabwe a lot, and, and of course Zimbabwe, I'm thinking more about wildlife now, but around the whole campfire uh, experience, yeah, sort of community-based natural resource management. And much of that failed, not because it wasn't actually bringing in a lot of money, but because there was basically elite capture of that money within the community, and it meant never really got into providing the community resources that was meant, yeah? And, I, you know, I, I mean, these are difficult things to manage, so I'd be interested if you could speak to that as well. Excellent question. So I can talk about this all day, so please make sure uh, when you stop me. Um, so elite capture is probably the cause of failure in community projects at about 70 to 80 percent around the world. So elite capture is a key thing to avoid. And we have had our, uh, let's call them discussions with district government who want to try and capture more of the revenue. And we have had our discussion with village government to try and capture more of the revenue. We have, let's look at it in the context of Yida. I'll explain how it works and perhaps this helps. First of all, the contract development process is really key. We develop a very detailed contract explaining exactly how this is going to roll out with those communities. Within that contract, we have uh, grievance and finance meetings every six months. They're in November and May because is a good time for the communities to think about school fees for January. May is a good time to think about buying maize when it becomes available in June, July. Um, the planning of the money because of its being contractual is all done by the community and it's done in a completely transparent way. And we can use electronic means to communicate what's going on very, very easily. Most people have telephones these days. Um, so there are ways to get around that. And we also look at it and are considerate of revenue transfer, both from a geographical space um, as well as a gender space, to ensure that decision making is happening and is wider and as broad a sense as possible. So 
yes, elite capture can be a problem and it's something you have to focus on and work on and we do. We have structures in place to ensure that, that that's properly managed. Does some revenue perhaps slip? Maybe, yes. Does the district spend the money that it should be spending on law enforcement there? Probably. In our experience, district accounts can be a bit of a black hole. But so, so, so there's definitely areas where money goes that doesn't have complete accountability. But in our experience so far, seven years into YIDA, we're, we have managed to avoid the pitfalls of elite capture. Okay, thank you. Um, I have maybe two or three questions. One is, um, is the central government involved in any way um, in the efforts you are, you are making? I can see around that wheel is the world, is the district, is the community. But does the central government come in? Can I answer that one first? Sure. Okay. And, and, and maybe an element of, of this question with regard to central government. Do you pay tax to the central government? Okay, well that's the answer, correct. I pay tax. And that's quite a lot of money in Tanzania, so yes. 60% of revenue goes directly to the community. That's a through and non-taxed. Okay, we pay tax on the 40% that we um, have within the company, so we pay tax. There's, there's another answer to that, that question. Under the Paris Climate Agreement, Tanzania has developed a forest reference emission level. That means that Tanzania, through the National Carbon Monitoring Center at the Sokoni University of Agriculture, has measured deforestation rates across the country. And so Tanzania will submit this methodology, RED, as part of its nationally determined contribution to global climate change. And so it can access money from the Green Climate Fund. Same methodology, same mechanism, different revenue flow. That's government to government revenue based on the same methodology. So yes, from 2021, Tanzania should be ready to go on its GCF application. Okay, the other question is, um, you are at the moment involved in a particular area. You yourself have just said that um, Tanzania potentially is, is, has got a lot of forests which could, be, could benefit from an intervention like what you are involved in. My question is, are you anticipating um, an extension of this work within Tanzania? and indeed possibly outside of Tanzania into other African countries with a similar potential or even bigger potential. Um, and then I think my final question is, um, is, do you see a possibility of collaborating with the NGOs involved in environmental work, be it that their involvement is often short term, Thank you. Excellent question. Um, so let me just answer the first one. We're not stopping. We're going to carry on going. My vision is tens of thousands of rural Tanzanians employed getting a monthly wage to protect millions of hectares of forest. That's my vision. That's where I'm going. That's what I want to do. I want to be the biggest tax taxpayer in Tanzania and I want it to come from forest protection. So that's where we're going. Nothing to stop us. Um, the answer to the next question is, I think Tanzania is my home. I know it. I understand it. I want to focus here. Yes, perhaps there's opportunities within the DRC. Um, but no, I think I've got enough to... Uh, keep myself busy in Tanzania until I've got no hair and I'm struggling to stand on the stage. <coughs> so in terms of collaborating with NGOs, we do already. We're partners with the Nature Conservancy, uh, Ujumar Community Resource Team who work in land rights and community rights. Um, we partner with Tuangani in Western Tanzania, um, which is a collaboration between Pathfinder International and the Nature Conservancy. Um, we partner with Honey Guide, 
who uh, work on WMA management and governance. So partnering with NGOs is an important part of what we do. So yes, we do already collaborate and we're always open to new collaborations. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, right now there is a lot of pressure to convert some of the forest reserves and game reserves for agriculture and the pastoralism. Do you see carbon trading as sort of a, a mechanism which would be used to safeguard these areas from conversion into agriculture and the pastoralism? So, as a Tanzanian organization, as a Tanzanian business, we can only develop red projects on village land and district area authority forest reserves. We cannot develop projects on game reserves, forest reserves, or national park because they are reserve land under the ownership of central government. Those areas fit into Tanzania's Paris Agreement commitment so those areas can receive money from the Green Climate Fund. And we're working in collaboration with the Tanzanian government to help develop the mechanism in which that can work. So the answer is yes. Um, if you look at the chronic underfunding that the forest, um, uh, Tanzanian Forest Service now, of course, TFS, has to manage some of these areas, and if you look at the chronic underfunding for many of the game reserves, you know, hunting provides revenue, yes, tourism provides the revenue, but they're very fickle businesses and very different, difficult to capture revenue from those businesses. Um, carbon can provide a lot more money. There is a lot more global value in that standing biomass in those forests than can be delivered by hunting or tourism. And of course, carbon can work in the context of overlaying. So you can have a tourism product and a carbon product, like we do in Yida. In Makame Wildlife Management Area, we have both a hunting product and a carbon product. So these things can go in, in partnership with each other, which makes the business model a lot more attractive and a lot more stable. So in terms of the reserve areas, that will be the responsibility of the Tanzanian government under the VPO's office to develop that finance mechanism with the Green Climate Fund. The areas outside of the reserves are areas where we can work to develop projects on village land. Okay, um, the question really is about possible pressures from the communities that um, are having to forego the kinds of benefits that they would usually get from the, from the, the forests. I, I believe some of those existential pressures are very real um, and I really don't know what solutions are there. If I can just pick one, the pressure to get wood for cooking. Um, that, that is, a, a, I think, one of the, of the big pressures. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit how that actually works out in practice? Um, we place no limit on dead biomass, be it standing or not, because as a carbon pool, as a point of measurement, dead wood is, is pretty useless anyway. Termites convert it pretty quickly in most of our landscapes and that will then emit the carbon dioxide. Um, so the, what we're talking about here from this point of measurement is the above and below ground biomass, the root structure and the living tree, not the grass, not dead wood, because of exactly that reason. So you're not restricting people's use of an area of land under their land use plan. What you're doing is you're following their land use plan and following an area that they've already designated for in Maasai, you would say, Ronjo, seasonal grazing. Yes? So they've already made that choice. We want to keep this area for seasonal grazing. Or we want to keep this area for Matumizi Kama, Mitia Matambiko, Nakitukama Hio. How's 
So, so th there's lots of reasons why people will protect their forests and protect their land. We work with those people who want to protect their land. We don't try and work with a community that doesn't want to protect its land. You know, if, if, and we do a very detailed viability analysis before we start to invest the $400,000, $500,000 that's needed to set up a carbon project. Because obviously we don't want to spend the money when there's a high chance of failure, if there's a business risk. Um, and, you know, if there's somebody who's also building a tobacco farm there to farm the area for tobacco, well, we wouldn't start a project. So, so those risks can be understood and learned and, you know, worked around to be able to, to make that. And in some cases, you can change your pool. So you could, say, overlay a red project where you already have sustainable timber. And you would say, okay, you're going to take out a thousand trees a year out of this area of... 30,000 hectares. Fine, we can just delete that from the carbon accounting straight away. And we can measure that. It's easy. So, so it's really a process of putting in some management. Thanks.